Hazlitt, Okemos Meridian Township, Home TV. Hello and welcome to another edition of Open Line. I am your host, Destin Kaufman, and we're coming to you from the home studios here at Home TV, Hazlitt, Okemos, and Meridian Township. Well, the, uh, they went in, they paid their $20 marriage fee, they cracked the champagne bottle, and they started to eat cake. But they are still left wondering if, in fact, they are married or they are not. And, of course, I'm referring to the uh, same-sex legislation that was overturned uh, and then, um, well, REIT overturned right after that. And so that leaves uh, some almost 60 people just here in uh, Ingham Township wondering, uh, or excuse me, Ingham County wondering, are we married or aren't we, are we not? Uh, here to uh, walk us through some of the uh, legal implications and, and the idea that maybe they aren't, even though they legally were, is Representative Sam Singh from the 69th District. Thank you very much for being here. And of course, Eva Lee Devendorf. She was the ex Executive Director at Equality Michigan, and it's nice to have you back as well. So uh, we'd like to start off the show by just running a quick package um, that was put together uh, by one of the interns here that just kind of outlines what the problem is and then we can take it from there. So let's go ahead and roll that. It was just two days after Governor Snyder's announcement that U.S. Attorney General Eric Holder issued this statement to extend eligibility for federal benefits to recognize all those same-sex couples that were married. The fight doesn't stop here. The ban on same-sex marriage in Michigan is still being maintained. And until the U.S. Court of Appeals makes their decision, those marriages will not be recognized by the state. You've got to accept the fact that this is who we are. We're not, cha nothing's changing overnight. <laughs> uh, because we get married, it doesn't change the fact that we were living our life the same way the day before. Taylor Kelsaw and his partner Chris have a domestic partnership, being together for over 20 years and living under the same roof. Together they are legal parents of their daughter Julia. Aww. He says they are waiting to get married right where they live, which is in the state of Michigan. We want the rights and, and, and laws to be in place here uh, and, and so that we can live our life justly. Living life justly is what something like marriage equality allows, which is one of the things John Holdley, an openly gay candidate running for state representative, values on a personal level. He also says it is important to him to be able to get married in Michigan. People are waiting. So literally families are waiting every single day. And some people are running out of time to wait. You know, that's why we need to move something now in Michigan. Michigan Equality has a petition calling on the governor and the attorney general to stop the lawsuit. Just stop it. Admit that you have lost this one. Admit that Michigan needs to be an equality state and move forward, attracting people to our state by allowing for equality. In Okemos, Alexandra Illich, Home TV. All right, thank you very much, Alexandra. And joining us, uh, better late than never, and we're happy to have him here, is uh, Nathan Triplett. He, of course, is the uh, mayor of East Lansing. Thank you uh, very much. For, Thanks for having for me being here. and for absolutely. your patience. Oh, no, absolutely. <laughs> Welcome. Um, so, you know, I went through the, the, the introduction of the topic. Um, obviously, it's, it's a fresh topic, and there's a lot to, uh, to be done. Um, I noticed, Sam, that y you had some... some choice words for Governor Schneider in his position to recognize that they were legal but not necessarily give them the the quality of what they are or the the, uh, the uh, understanding that yes we will give you the Michigan benefits tell us a little bit about what benefits are they not going to get in him not recognizing that well you know again uh, the state of Michigan provides a lot of benefits to couples uh, and one of them is something we're going to see next week uh, we're getting ready to file our taxes and uh, those people who are uh, in same-sex uh, marriages do not get the same provision of a tax benefit uh, for their marriage. Uh, they can do it on the federal level, but unfortunately in the state of Michigan we don't. And so uh, just uh, about two months ago I actually introduced a set of bills that said if you're recognized on the federal level and you can jointly file your taxes, you should be able also be able to do that here in the state of Michigan. Right now the language says a, a, a you know, husband and wife 
have to file. And so this way we would take out those types of references, say anyone who's eligible to file jointly can do that. So there's a number of those types of, of benefits that are, are not being provided. You know, if they're employees of the state, uh, they're not going to receive health care. Uh, and those types of benefits that they could as a, under a family type of package. So there's a number of those types of things that are really concerning to us. Um, from, a, from a perspective of, of equality, um, the argument that uh, marriage is, is typically or traditionally, I should say, defined as a relationship between a man and a woman. Is the argument just over really the word marriage if all of the other um, uh, benefits to being married would be given to a same-sex couple isn't it really then just the argument over a word and and why why would that not why would that equate to inequality um, I guess to try to understand your your question better it it sounds like you you're asking um, why we would want specifically for us to have marriage equality and not just the rights extended to us. Correct. Um, because in this country, it's not just about the rights. It's not just about the civil legal benefits, but also that in this country, marriage is, is a symbol of our commitment to each other and our partners. And that does mean something to, to our, our families as well. When you ask a same-sex couple why they want to enter into, into the institution of marriage, as much as it matters that under, under federal law there are over 1,100 rights that are tied to the institution of marriage that you're denied if you don't have access to that institution, um, the majority of our couples, the main story that you will hear is that we have fallen in love with somebody and we want to take care of them and we want to be able to commit in front of those that we love in our our place of worship often um, our lives to that person that this is this is a sacred thing to us and that the institution of marriage that symbol means something to us the same thing that it means to everybody else so the idea of marriage means the same thing to us as it does to everybody else and it's not just a civil right right um the is when you get uh, civilly married or a civil union do, are you extended as a couple at that point the same benefits as as a marriage it really depends and and in many ways you are not um it, that again leaves us in this gray area. So the way that the US Supreme Court interpreted um, this last decision um, was to say that um, that's not, that is not necessarily the case. And, um, and Nathan can, can explain this um, if, if he wants to, but um, it, it is still a separate but equal situation to us that it being defined as something else is to very clearly say that we are being put on a hierarchy and being offered something that spells out we're being considered something and somebody else and therefore less than. Um, and the, the US government said essentially that, that, that civil unions are not the same thing as marriages. I think, we, I think by this point in this country's history, we should have learned the lesson that separate but equal is never actually equal. And that's not just um, rhetoric. That's actually the legal case as well. In states that have adopted domestic partnership or civil union programs, they may have provided state equivalent benefits, but those individuals don't have access to the 1,100 federal rights of marriage that Emily made reference to earlier. Um, the, the only thing that will provide people full access to all of the rights and responsibilities of marriage are legal civil marriages that are recognized by both state and federal governments across the country. This patchwork that folks have tried to create to avoid um, using the word marriage or giving access, really equal access to the institution, just creates a cloud of legal uncertainty and confusion for these couples. Sam made a great point about taxes. When you file your Michigan taxes, you start with your federal adjusted gross income. So couples in Michigan who are going to file their taxes will have to prepare federal taxes uh, where they can file as a married couple, and then they'll have to file or they'll have to prepare a separate set of federal taxes to get the right adjusted gross income so they can fill out their state taxes where they won't be recognized as married. 
there's, there's no reason for that, and that's a, a very concrete example of how not having equal access to this institution impairs individuals and um, results in these difficulties, and that's just not extra paperwork. That's actually a tangible financial impact where this discrimination is costing their families. I would like to uh, remind everybody this is a call-in show. If you uh, have a question, certainly, or a comment for the panel or myself, please feel free to call in. Uh, the number is 517-349-1232. Uh, you can also tweet questions to us at at home TV. Um, I guess I want to just kind of run down the, the way that this whole thing happened. So the, in 2004, the, the voters of Michigan, um, and I think it was right around 60%, decided that uh, marriage would be defined between uh, a man and a woman only. Uh, then um, a month ago, uh, uh, Judge uh, uh, Bernard Friedman struck that down, saying uh, that's, you know, that's not constitutional, we're not going to do it. And I believe that happened uh, late on a Friday, um, at which time Saturday morning, uh, marriage licensing uh, offices opened up uh, to grant these marriage licenses and then I believe before the end of the day on Saturday it, there was a stay of, of the ruling and then the marriage licenses were halted. The problem is that some th almost 300 people got these marriage licenses. Is it a little strange that one person would decide you know and I'm gonna play devil's advocate a lot through this show because Everybody on the panel is, is in the same arena as far as the, the topic is concerned, but isn't it a little presumptuous for one person to take away the rights and the voting rights of the entire state of Michigan in making that decision? It's actually not when we're talking about something that is unconstitutional, and it's actually, it was actually over 600 people because it was, it was over 300 couples. So over oh, six, okay. yeah, Thank over you. 600 people um, were able to get married that day and were able to, for those five hours, try to access equality under the law for the first time. And that's what those, that's what those four county clerks were trying to provide in that time. Um, but, but no, 10 years ago, 59% uh, of Michiganders voted to, to put this ban in place. And 10 years later, polling shows that 59% of Michiganders now believe they made, they made a mistake. 59% of Michiganders actually believe that that ban is unconstitutional. So they now believe that that ban is unconstitutional. 57% would like to repeal that constitutional ban and put into place full marriage equality. And these, uh, this is a Glenn Gariff poll that was done in, in March. Um, so not only are voters in a place that they, they were opposite of 10 years ago, but we've seen throughout history that often, um, most often, when it comes to civil rights, when it's something that is unconstitutional and getting in the way of basic human rights, you can't leave it to the majority to check, them, check themselves and their own power and, and to put into place civil rights and human rights for the minority that is still struggling to um, to, to empower themselves and, and to, to close that disparity. You have to count on the judicial system. You have to count on, on our federal judges and the U.S. Supreme Court. That is how we have been able to, to close in on, on getting people to, to win their, their basic human rights throughout U.S. history. Well, and I, I think not only is Emily right, obviously, yeah, that, well said, that, yes, that the Constitution trumps um, the majority deciding they want to make a decision about someone's fundamental rights, but I think there's an attempt to pretend like Judge Friedman is an outlier in this calculation and this determination that these bans violate the Equal Protection Clause, when in fact, as of this afternoon, because there was yet another one this afternoon, 10 consecutive federal judges have all concluded that state bans on marriage equality that have come to their courts violate the Equal Protection Clause of the U.S. Constitution, uh, Indiana being the most recent federal district court to make that ruling today. So 
you know, this has never been about an individual making a decision about his or her preferences sitting from behind that bench. This has been about people taking tried and true principles embodied in the United States Constitution and applying the law as our system intended it. It was never supposed to be the case where voters could decide anything. That's why we have a Constitution. And I think that these courts have rightly concluded that bans on marriage equality are a clear violation of the Equal Protection Clause. And ultimately, one of these cases, personally, I hope it's the DeBoer case, makes it its way to the US Supreme Court. And that court concludes once and for all, with its power to make a final determination, that these discriminatory bans violate the United States Constitution. And that's where, where we're headed um, rather rapidly at this point, frankly, in terms of how quickly these things normally move. Why, why all of a sudden? In other words, what do you think it is that has caused it to become such a hot issue so quickly? In other words, we voted in 2004, and now it's 2014, so 10 years later, and it's just within the last year, two years, that it's, we've really got the national attention has really hit it, and it's really just kind of motored through. Why wasn't the equal rights thing you know, addressed 10 years ago? Well, that's the unfortunate part of our, our legal system. Sometimes it's very slow. And uh, you know, when these types of uh, actions were taken, whether they were by, done by legislatures or they were done by referendum, they began to go through their process through the courts. And so why you're seeing, I think, a lot of this happening very rapidly, these court decisions happening in the last you know, year plus, is that the Supreme Court made a decision last summer. And that uh, decision, you know, opened up the door. Now, they didn't finish their job, which I think many of us would have hoped they would have finished their job. But uh, eventually, whether it's in a year and a half or two years, we anticipate that they will finally take one of these cases and they will finally rule and it will be done with a, as an issue. But again, this has been an issue that people have been talking about and fighting about for, for years. I think it's just that the, the legal cases have finally gotten up to a high enough level uh, that they're getting a lot more, more attention. So then why, why not have a, another vote? If the majority of Michiganders now do agree with it, wouldn't that also be a way to immediately solve the problem? If we do not win through the courts, we absolutely intend to put this back on the ballot. But um, we do think that there's a good chance that this case may go to the Supreme Court and that we can win through the courts. Um, but we don't put human rights on the ballot if we don't have to. Um, we don't believe that that's the way that it should be, that we should have um, the, the majority voting on the rights of the minority. Um, we think it's unfortunate that it happened in the first place. Um, we do think if we have to put it on the ballot, we absolutely will win. But we think that we can, we can let this run its course um, and that there's a good chance that, that we will win. And if this does not happen fast enough, we will have already laid the groundwork to put it on the ballot in 2016, absolutely. Every day we are working towards putting it on the ballot in 2016 and winning at the ballot in 2016. If we were to compare this, this same uh, legislative issue with the fact uh, that marijuana is now becoming more and more and more legal, I guess, um, and some would say, well, you know, now, and I know that it's different because it's not a civil rights issue, but the one government saying, state government saying that, yes, we will, we will allow our, our, our citizens to carry or have marijuana, but then the federal government says, no, we will not, uh, we will not follow that, and it is still illegal in our eyes. Do you find that the disconnect between the federal government and the state governments is part of the issue? Well, certainly it has an impact on these individuals. I mean, family law has always been the province of the states. Normally, the federal government doesn't get involved in regulating what a marriage is, but that's because there hasn't previously been a constitutional issue about discrimination or not one that we recognize. But has been pointed out by the panel, our understanding of what equal protection means has evolved over the last many years. And as a result, that's where this federal constitutional issue has arisen. Um, but ultimately, I think everyone would acknowledge that uniformity on this point across the country is the goal and would make it easier for all parties involved. Right now, you have a situation, there's this whole other group of people that we seldom talk about. And that's all of the folks who live in Michigan who are lawfully married in one of the 17 states in the District of Columbia or one of the other countries that um, have recognized it, who now live in Michigan. And it's like, as soon as they cross the border into the state of Michigan, that legal recognition evaporated. Our state doesn't acknowledge it. 
Um, and so clearly that issue has to be resolved in the long run. And, and several of these cases that are now working their way through the federal appellate courts address that issue of couples not being recognized when they've been lawfully married elsewhere. So I think that that's part of the reason why you see this heading towards the Supreme Court, because our system doesn't work well when you have this patchwork of varying regulations that are treating people in a discriminatory fashion, and then the governments don't know how to react to them. It's not easy to provide these rights and responsibilities when the rules are different when you stand on this side of a border and then cross into this state where it's completely different. Um, and so ultimately, I think that's why getting to the Supreme Court, where this issue can be decided once and for all, that bans on marriage equality violate the Equal Protection Clause, would create that kind of uniformity across the nation and settle all of those disputes, which right now, the last time I checked, there were over 60 of these cases pending at various levels of the judicial system in 30 states and territories. Um, that's a lot of time and energy being expended on settling what most people regard now, especially in legal circles, as something that's rapidly becoming a settled issue on this equal protection question. So we're getting there, but it does take a process. And I would note that Sam's right, the Windsor decision in 2013 was a key piece, but really you have to go back 20 years. Like there have been case after case in front of the Supreme Court, Romer versus Evans in 1996, striking down Colorado's discriminatory amendment too. Lawrence versus Texas in 2003, striking down Texas's anti-sodomy law. Windsor in 2013. There's always a progression to these things. Very rarely in US history do you see a moment where the court just miraculously takes care of something uh, in one foul swoop. So it's clearly been and will continue to be until it reaches a final decision, um, a process. I, I hope that someday we read history books and the progression you see is Romer, Lawrence, Windsor, DeBoer, and that Michigan is able to be the state that finally ends this marriage discrimination across the United States. Well, I'll take anything that's a success for Michigan at this point. Um, you actually answered another question because I was going to say, why, why don't they just drive across the state, get married, and then come back? So then it doesn't matter if they have it there. It's just not recognized here at all. Um, is it true that uh, Governor Schneider is, is playing it the way that he has to from a legal perspective? Because if, if the courts say that they are now on hold, isn't he required to follow what the courts are telling him to do? Well, I think you have to take a look at what happened to those individuals that Saturday morning. That Saturday morning, they followed the law, and the law allowed them to be married. And so now there's this question about, you know, what are their rights? But they followed every single law that was on the books at that point in time. And so I think that's why many of us believe that they are legally married, I was pleased to at least hear the governor use those words. Right. But then what I saw the governor do, I think, was much more political in nature than it was legal in nature. And I, I feel, you know, we're in a, an election year. He's in running for re-election, and I think he tried to kind of play a little bit in, in the middle of, of this uh, conversation. And that's why, you know, I think you'd mentioned earlier some of the comments that uh, myself, uh, Senator Whitmer, and others made about the governor was that, you know, he was being very dismissive. You know, he was saying that these were not really big issues, that, you know, these were not uh, important issues. And we wanted to push back on him because these are economic issues. These are issues about families and children. And uh, we unfortunately didn't really see that out of our governor. Our attorney general, uh, the case that he brought forward, uh, you know, was somewhat ridiculed by the judge in, in his opinion, if you read the opinion, where he calls some of those state's witnesses unbelievable, uh, called them fringe. And when you see that type of language coming from a very moderate judge who was appointed by uh, Ronald Reagan, uh, you know, you, you kind of wonder, are we wasting our taxpayer dollars? And, uh, you know, if you've seen now 10 cases on the federal level, why are we continuing to spend taxpayer dollars? And that's the question we really put towards the governor and the attorney general. And we've asked them to stop. They don't have to appeal uh, this case. Uh, they've made that decision. And to us and to me specifically, it's a political decision more than a legal decision. I would like to remind everyone this is a call-in show. If you'd like to be a part of the show and ask the panel or myself a question, please feel free to do so. The number is at the bottom of your screen. Um, if, she, if, if they opened up the, 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 the offices on a Saturday, that's uncommon, isn't it? I mean, legal uh, government offices are, are never open on a Saturday. Do you think that that was a specific decision because they knew that it, this was only going to last a couple hours or a day or two? Was that the reason why there was such a rush to get that open? 
I, I think that the four county clerks, who in my opinion did the right thing by opening their offices, uh, made a, a simple determination, and that is that these couples have waited long enough. Um, I married five couples that Saturday at the Ingham County Courthouse. There were a total of 57 married in Ingham County, and many of the couples that were married that day have been together as a couple longer than I've been alive. I mean, think about that for a second. The state has denied them the right to call their relationship what it is and to get the benefits that they should have been entitled to for that entire time for longer than I've been alive. And I think the, the clerks looked at the opportunity they had. They looked at the pleas from these couples to finally have access to the respect and the recognition and the rights they deserve. And they made the right decision to open their office so that they didn't have to wait one minute longer. And I think that Sam's point is absolutely correct. All applicable Michigan laws were followed. The licenses were properly issued. The marriages were performed in front of two witnesses. They were solemnized by a person with statutory authority and they were filed with the county clerk. All, all T's have been crossed, all I's have been dotted. There, there's no argument for those marriages not being legal and as has already been pointed out, the governor acknowledges as much. So he's really taken this uh, unprecedented position, if you look across the country where these situations have happened, of acknowledging the legality of these unions and then saying, but, I'm not going to allow the state to extend you the rights that I've already said myself you're entitled to. And frankly, I'm personally confident there's work being done right now to uh, line up plaintiffs for a legal challenge to that decision as well, that that position will be vindicated in the courts, that the courts will say, Governor Snyder, you can't have it both ways. You can't say that these are lawful unions and then deny people the rights that they are entitled to under Michigan law. Now, if a marriage happened after the stay, that's a different story. But all these marriages we're talking about happened when no stay was in place. So the governor can't say, well, these unions don't deserve benefits because there's a stay. But there was no stay when these marriages were conducted. And by his own admission, they meet all requirements under Michigan law. Uh, and so I think that's likely the next shoe that you're going to see drop in this situation is a legal challenge to the governor's determination that he can have it both ways, because he can. I love the explanations that our own county clerks that opened their offices gave. Um, Lisa Brown said that on every other day she is unfortunately forced to treat uh, people in Michigan as as unequal under the law, LGBT people as unequal under the law, and um, she had an opportunity to treat them as equal under the law that day. And Barb Byram said, yes, she opened her office, but she opened her office and treated her treated it as any other day that the clerk's office is open. And, and again, she just treated LGBT people as equal under the law that day. And that day she also issued birth certificates and, and gun licenses. And, licenses. and right. yeah, yeah, yeah. And there was something else, but. Uh, there was a, she issued a marriage license to an opposite sex right, couple, right, yeah. marriage licenses to same sex couples, and I believe it was two concealed pistol licenses and two requests for birth certificates. Yeah, so their office yeah. was business open for as business usual. Right, as business usual. Business as usual, all day long, and just an additional day that the, that the office was open. Um, and that's, that's essentially all they did was just one more day that the office was open because they knew our attorney general and they knew how fast this could move and they knew they were the ones in Michigan that day that had the authority to do this, and, and it rested on them. It seems like it, it, it's kind of a bad decision uh, politically for uh, Mr. Schneider to, do, to say that, that they're valid, and then not honor them. That seems a little odd to me. What do you, uh, how, how would he proceed from here, though? Let's say that he did and does get told that he has to honor those marriages. But then there's all the people who didn't get them before the stay. Uh, you know, isn't that kind of even more discriminatory to those people because they didn't have the opportunity to make it into the office that day? I mean, you see, I mean, we're dealing with levels of discrimination all the way through this. Well, the governor and the attorney general are the two people with the power to make that discrimination stop. They could withdraw their appeal. Um, at which point the Sixth Circuit could lift the stay and we could go back to allowing these couples to get lawfully married in Michigan. He, these are two individuals who literally are in the driver's seat on all these issues. They're the ones deciding to push the appeal. They're the ones deciding not to recognize the marriages that were lawfully performed. Neither the governor nor the attorney general have a leg to stand on as though this is someone else's fault. They bear all of the responsibility for the decision to continue to push this appeal forward and to deny these people the rights that they're entitled to. He could wake up tomorrow morning and go out and do a similar press interview and say, I've changed my mind, I've decided to recognize these couples, and I've decided to ask the attorney general to withdraw the state's appeal into Bohr versus Snyder. 
and this would all be over. Now, I have zero confidence that either of them are willing to make that decision, even though it's the right one, but it's totally within their power to do so. But I think you make a point without even trying to make a point, and that's that any move that they make makes the argument for us, and any move they don't make makes the argument for us that they're on the wrong side of history, because it all makes very clear that it's completely illogical that these things aren't happening because it it shows the inconsistency it shows the gray area it shows how confusing it is and um, it shows how backwards michigan is everything they do and don't do shows how far behind michigan is and there's other precedent if you take a look at how other states are dealing with this issue when their bans have been uh, taken down a few of them have also decided not to appeal uh, that that process and so you know there is uh, an opportunity if they really wanted to deal with this issue uh, to deal with this issue but I do think uh, you know Mayor Triplett's right uh, I think they've made a political calculation in an election year and that's what they're focused on instead of doing what's right and what's legal under the law well not just a few I think it's important this is not an outlier situation eight different state attorney generals have decided not to appeal these type of decisions that have struck down state bans on marriage equality, eight. So the, when the attorney general acts as though that his oath requires him to do this or the law requires him to do this, that's just simply not true. Both Sam and I took the exact same oath that the attorney general took when we were sworn in, um, in my case, to the East Lansing City Council in Representative Singh's case as a state representative. And the first line of that oath is swearing to uphold the Constitution of the United States. So. In this case, where it is clear that these laws violate the Equal Protection Clause, the Attorney General could do what eight of his colleagues across the country have done, say, I swore to uphold the U.S. Constitution, this law violates the U.S. Constitution, and I will no longer waste taxpayer resources appealing it uh, and denying Michiganders the rights they deserve. That's unfortunately not the choice that he's made, but it's certainly a choice available to him. Do you have any figures on the cost of what the, the, this continued battle costs us as the taxpayers? Anyway. We've been asking. We've asked the question uh, to uh, the governor and the attorney general to get us the actual numbers. I know for uh, the three um, uh, witnesses that they brought forward, the ones that, again, the judge had called fringe and unbelievable, uh, you know, we know they spent $40,000 specifically for those three witnesses. And so uh, they've been somewhat stonewalling, uh, you know, getting us those numbers. But I'm, I'm sure it's clearly in the six figures and, uh, you know, obviously a wasted uh, resource. Uh, when we have difficult times, why aren't we focused on, you know, economic development and the things that will help our economy? Why are we, you know, fighting uh, against the U.S. Constitution uh, in this case? And that's what many of us are trying to tell the governor and the attorney general. Um, I'm sure that you've all uh, heard and, and are aware of the uh, horrific attack that occurred in uh, Ypsilanti. Um, I'm not that familiar with the city, but I think it's it's a fairly nice it's city. I don't think it's uh, you know like a a, a crime ridden city. Um, but uh, we, we actually were trying to get uh, some couples to come on the show until we came across that article, and we all decided that we didn't want to help any situation like that potentially occur again. So. Um, there's, there's obviously a group of people out there that are adamantly against this idea. And has, has there been any thought as to if, if, it, if it becomes legal in Michigan, what are some of those ramifications? And is everybody prepared to deal with that? Equality Michigan um, is a statewide LGBT organization half of what we do is actually victim services and um, anti-violence work. So we're responsible for working on the hate crimes and we're actually working with Ypsilanti on that particular case. And anytime we see progress on equality for the LGBT community and actually progress for any community that is vulnerable and is in the minority, we see increased backlash and violence and discrimination. We always see increased backlash when there's progress against a minority population. Um, so we always anticipate it. Um, our victim services director would say we were surprised that it took that long, and that's sad. Um, so we were not surprised when this attack happened. We see violent attacks regularly in our office. Um, Equality Michigan actually worked on the case that was 
that was only the second case ever to be prosecuted under the Federal Hate Crimes Act, um, and that was an anti-LGBT um, hate crimes act or hate crime. Um, so it's it's fairly uh, normal for us to have the resistance that comes from the fringe turn into something ugly and violent um, in reaction to movement forward. And we do anticipate it, and that's why we don't want to cultivate this unrealistic idea that marriage solves everything. We in Michigan don't have an Ethnic Intimidation Act that includes protections for us. Even though there's a Federal Hate Crimes Act, Michigan's Hate Crimes Act doesn't actually have the LGBT population as one of the populations that is included in the groups of people that are protected. I read that. Yes. Shocking. Um, in, and in addition, we also know that even if we win marriage, um, somebody can get married on Friday, they can take that wedding picture, they can put it on their desk on Monday, and they can get, get fired for somebody seeing them with their new spouse and their employer not liking um, them being gay because it's perfectly legal to be fired in Michigan for being gay. It's perfectly legal to be deni denied housing. You can still get kicked out of a restaurant for being gay or for somebody thinking that you're gay or for somebody not liking how you express your gender. So we still have a long way to go and we do have to recognize that as we move forward and as long as we aren't checking hate violence and hate speech and as long as we are empowering those who work against us and, and speak in very um, violent ways towards us um, and in extremist ways towards us, we are also empowering those who are um, likely to do those types of things. And we need, to, we need to be strengthening those other protections as well. What a gut-wrenching type of normal for somebody's job, as you said, that's normal for you. Um, amazing. Um, I want to read a quote from Stephen Haney. Uh, he wrote a book called The Marriage Trail, or A Marriage Trail, and the quote is that marriage is a privilege, not a right. Marriage was created to allow society to support heterosexual couples in procreation only. How do you respond? Well, then there are a lot of heterosexual couples that are unable to conceive or that have chosen not to have children or that are on their second marriage and they have decided not to have children or are past the age where they can have children that Bill Schuette would really like to not allow to get married under his current definition and the, the author's definition. That it just does not logically pan out that that is the traditional, that should be the traditional definition for marriage. Procreation is not why most people choose to get married anymore. Um, and in fact, the, the trend these days is uh, that a lot of heterosexual couples, young couples, older couples are choosing not to get married, period, more and more. If we are trying to preserve the institution of marriage, we should be encouraging anybody who wants to get married, um, who is in, in a consenting um, adult, uh, and I mean, they and love each other and support each other. Our, our same-sex couples are are wanting to care for their partners and 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 raise raise wonderful families and and support their children and um, you'll see in other states that that allow same-sex marriage that within the first few days of of striking down those bans and allowing same-sex marriage uh, that we see majorities of the same-sex populations in those states go and get married um, right. if you want to preserve the institution of marriage you let us in because heterosexual couples are, are, are not trying to hold on right. <laughs> too strongly and right then now. We have to take a look at, you know, when you look at a marriage license, it's really a government vehicle at this point in right. time. The way our laws are written, you have to, you know, go to the governmental entity and file your license and therefore then be recognized by the government. And so again, if you're having a governmental function uh, that we're talking about here, that's really the, the question uh, and whether or not we should be able to give, uh, should a government be able to discriminate? 
And that's what you know the, the author of this quote is saying, and that's what other people are saying right. on the other side of this issue. Uh, you know, if you were just at that uh, that courthouse on on Saturday and I stopped by for a little period of time, you could just see you know the happiness, the love uh, that was there. And you know, as a governmental official, how can I discriminate against that? I took an oath, and uh, you know, I can't understand why any governmental official would be able to to do that and be able to sleep at night. But again, that's why we're dealing with this issue. Um, it, it was interesting in the research. Uh, the pros and the cons, there's many, many websites, pros and cons, and the cons really didn't stack up to the pros, I mean, pretty much on, in a general sense, um, which I'm sure that you, you all know that as well. Um, I did look up the definition of marriage as well, because one of the big arguments that I hear, you know, from, well, all around, it, it, marriage is a, is a religious institution. It's not a governmental institution, and the religions define it as you know, a union between a man and a woman. However, on Wikipedia, there's no part of that in the definition of marriage whatsoever. I mean, if you scroll down, there's a little bit of about how religious ceremonies. Um, if it's become then a government institution more than anything else, uh, other than what it is to those individual people that are sharing that experience, why then hasn't the government as far, in other words, why hasn't the federal government come in and just said, look, this is the way that it should be, and this is obviously what the definition of a marriage is. This is what we're going to follow. That's it. Well, again, family relations are not something that are mentioned in the Constitution. It's not really within the sphere of federal power. We have a, a federal government. I know sometimes it doesn't seem like it, but we have a federal government of limited authority. They can only deal with the things that are granted to them by the people in the states, and this isn't one of those issues. Traditionally, it's been left to the states. The reason that it can't be left to the states in toto in this situation is because several states, Michigan included, have chosen to adopt rules that clearly violate the U.S. Constitution. So th the federal government simply um, to just mandate that across the board um, without reliance on this constitutional argument is going beyond the scope of what they, what their proper role is. What their role in here is to make sure that whatever definition we have comports with the U.S. Constitution. There are lots of things that can differ between states that wouldn't raise an issue. Um, in Michigan, to get a marriage license, one of the partners has to be a resident of the county that they're applying for the license in unless they happen to be from out of state. That rule is not true everywhere in the country because that isn't relevant. Different states have different rules. Um, there are different age limits in different states for who's allowed to get married. Again, there isn't the same constitutional implication. The reason the federal government has to be involved in this in the form of the courts is because we've chosen a rule that transgresses the Constitution. Right. But other than that, the rest of these things should be left to the states. Family law is a matter for state governments, not for the federal government, as long as we don't violate the Constitution. And thank goodness we don't go by whatever anybody says is the definition of marriage, because I don't want to be property, and I don't want right. to exist for the purpose of making sure that there is a, is, there is a larger population of whatever I represent to somebody. The definitions of marriage um, have changed over time for, for a reason, and a lot of times it has been specifically to ensure that um, we are providing human rights right. and, um, and, <coughs> and doing so because we've been wrong in the past. Right. Well, and, and we would be remiss, I think, um, before we move off this topic, although this conversation is about marriage as a government institution, some of the comments at times uh, infer that all people of faith are opposed to equal rights for LGBT people, that all people of faith are opposed to the ability of two loving individuals who happen to be of the same sex to get married. That, that is clearly not true. There were clergy performing ceremonies at each of the four counties that opened up for licenses. There are many churches here in our own community that are open and affirming who uh, have LGBT people who are serving as pastors, who are involved in the life of those churches. So I think it's important in these conversations to point out that what we're talking about is a government institution, but there are many people of faith out there who really bristle at the notion that discrimination and faith are synonymous with one another because that's, that's just simply not true. Right. I'm glad you brought that point up because that, that in, the research does indeed say that. Um, uh, an associate here at uh, Home TV did point out that there is a woman named Erica Eiffel who uh, married successfully the Eiffel Tower. 
in a commitment ceremony in 2007. And so her comment was, if you can marry legally an inanimate object, why can you not marry somebody of the same sex? I thought that was one of the greatest <laughs> things I've ever heard. Um, scary about the Eiffel Tower, obviously, but interesting. So b back to right specifically where we are in Michigan. These people have absolutely no rights at this point until it goes to a court and a court decides. No, now. no state rights. State I mean, rights, but the, the Eric Holder extended the federal right. rights. Right, so okay. 1,100 or so federal rights that they now have by virtue of the attorney, U.S. Attorney General's recognition, but no state rights. So that includes the tax issues that Representative Singh brought up. For many of these couples, the most devastating part of it is it also means that it's difficult for them now to petition in state court to be able to jointly adopt their children. So it's not just the couples that are being injured by the governor's decision. It's these children who now do not have the benefit of legal parenting relationships with both of their parents and the security that that brings. Because again, that is a state court issue and they can't take their legal Michigan marriage license under what the governor has said into a Michigan court and have that um, adoption legalized in the state of Michigan. So you know, there, there's a lot of different components of that, but you're right, they have access to none of those state rights, only the federal rights. What is their, what's their next step if, if the court fails to, because it would just be a local court, right? It wouldn't, I mean, they, they wouldn't go up to a high court at that point. It would just be a local, so they're just going to have to follow the court system until, you know, it works for them? Well, I mean, there's, again, there's a couple of different things. One thing that would resolve this is the Supreme Court finally making a ruling, but there's also this issue of filing uh, a separate legal action on behalf of these couples against the state of Michigan to have a court, which would in all likely be a Michigan Circuit Court, circuit court. saying that, that these couple, that what the governor did was illegal um, and forcing him to recognize it. Now, I think we can all probably acknowledge that that would in inevitably be appealed, and so there's a process there as well, but these couples unfortunately are left in legal limbo until the courts, be they state courts through that action or federal courts, um, come to a final determination about this. But again, that, that is only true because of discretionary decisions made by Governor Snyder and Attorney General Schutte. They can make all of that go away tomorrow if they wanted to. They've just opted not to. Yeah, it, I mean, recent polls say that upwards of 70-ish percent of voter, voters under 30 today, uh, you know, think that it, it, it should be a legalized issue. Um, if the, the, the governor decides, you know, down the line, and, you know, that's going to be his, his decision, obviously, but, um, do, you, do you think that the economic impact of, of having a state where same-sex marriage is legalized is going to be significant? I think it is. I mean, if you take a look at just at the business case uh, for being open uh, to the LGBT community, I think you just look at the Fortune 500 companies. You take a look at those companies who recognize marriage, who recognize benefits uh, to uh, their employees, who actively uh, recruit and attract employees, I, I think you would see that. Uh, that that's, that business community is very open to the uh, LGBT community. And if we want to be that state that, again, is competing with the best workforce in the entire country, you want to be open to, to all people. And if you are uh, looking at different jobs in different states and you know this state doesn't recognize you and your family, why would you come here? And so, you know, I. I was a little bit critical of the governor when he said this, this was just a social issue. He said, I want to focus on the economy. And many of us laughed at it because this is an economic issue. Uh, because we want to be a, an open state, we want to be a diverse state, we want to make sure that uh, we're competitive uh, with the rest of the uh, country and the rest of the world. All things that he kind of pushes and says a lot in interviews. So that's interesting. Um, we've got just a couple of minutes left. Um, Best case scenario for Michigan, um, obviously it's an election year uh, and he's, he's fully aware of that. Um, if he gets reelected, uh, chances are he's probably going to follow his, his same path unless a court decides. Uh, what are some of the things that maybe some of the viewers can do to uh, express their opinions uh, on this particular matter? So what's the best outlet? Well, I mean, I would really suggest that people reach out to the governor's office directly, uh, reach out to the attorney general's office directly, ask them 
uh, to, you know, stop this appeal. When they see them at events, uh, you know, they're going to be doing campaign stops and so forth. I think, you know, there's a real opportunity for us to say, let's stop wasting this taxpayer dollars and let's look at uh, legalizing equality here in the state of Michigan and, you know, make sure that this is part of their decision making process. And so I would really recommend uh, to the listeners uh, that they really reach out directly to both the governor and the attorney general and let their feelings be told. And as far as the, the idea and the notion that somebody can be fired, you know, because they're, uh, they're gay, um, how, how is that going to follow along? Because if, if we legalize same-sex marriages, then that opens up, you know, another set of problems with that particular ruling. Um, I assume that that would be your, your second biggest battle to, to bring well, on? Well, we, we don't battle these things in a certain order. We battle them all at the same time. So we're, we're continuing to work towards amending our State Civil Rights Act as we speak, as we work on marriage. So we're still working towards that right now. I'm really happy to say these two champions are, are helping us all along the way, still trying to, to amend our State Civil Rights Act. And, and we're having really great conversations on both sides of the aisle. Um, with Democrats and Republicans and talking about why we need to amend our Civil Rights Act this year, next year, as soon as possible, because every day that we go without amending our state Civil Rights Act, there is that danger. There is real harm happening. As I said, at Equality Michigan, we work on discrimination cases, and we hear from people regularly who are getting fired from their jobs. And the reason that the, a lot of those stories aren't being told publicly is because when you, it's legal to fire you from your job, or it or you are in getting harassed and you can be fired from your job, you can't be open about that because there is no legal recourse. There is no protection for you. Um, so we need to stop that harm as, as soon as possible because every day without those protections, there is real tangible harm. So we are working towards that every day and, and we will continue to, and hopefully we will have a solution for that um, sooner than later. And, and maybe that will come before marriage. And we do think that that is a priority for our <coughs> legislators right now. Yeah, and I would just say from a legislative side, uh, there have been good conversations, both from Republicans and Democrats. And, you know, I'm hopeful, uh, you know, as we get past uh, the election uh, cycle here that we will be able to have uh, a bill introduced uh, that has bipartisan support that um, can work its way through both uh, chambers. You know, there has been uh, bills to deal with this issue that have been introduced in previous legislative sessions. So there's already a template out there that I think uh, a number of my Democratic colleagues are, are in support of, and we're working now because both of our chambers are led by Republicans at this point in time to work with them. And so my hope is that, you know, by the late fall time frame, we can uh, take a look at this issue and hopefully resolve it legislatively. You know, unfortunately, we think uh, with marriage equality, we have to do that through the courts. Uh, but at this point, I think, you know, making sure that we're protecting people's employment, their housing opportunities, uh, those types of civil rights, I think we can do that legislatively. And you find you, in your, your talking around, that is the majority of the opinion. Well, I think you, you talk to people, and many of my Republican colleagues, and you say you can be fired for being gay. Their immediate reaction is, no, you can't. That's against the law. And we're like, no, we'll show you the law and where there is a, a hole. And then they realize that, right. and then they come around to that issue. Uh, but many of them, um, you know, I think just were ill-informed and right. just actually thought it was already against the law. Right. Well, it's kind of shocking that it isn't, so I can understand why that's, you know, that is what it is. Um, I should note quickly that please. The, the only place that that would not be the case is in the 32 Michigan cities and townships that have banned it locally, and we happen to be sitting in one of them right now. Right. Meridian Township and East Lansing are two of those 32. So I think what I, what I talk to, when I, what I say when I talk to legislators is your, your constituents are already ahead of you. Your local officials are already ahead of you. We've done this. All you've got to do is follow our lead. So I, there's already a blueprint out there, and there are champions like Representative Singh who are working on bringing that statewide, but we see more and more communities every day stepping up to fill the gap where the legislature hasn't taken this action. And I think, again, all the legislature has to do is look at the local officials in their districts who have already taken up this issue and done the right thing for their LGBT constituents. And to the business leaders that are saying that they shouldn't have to shoulder the burden of, right. of extending those protections. And the local governments shouldn't have to shoulder the burden, that our state should create a uniform um, protection so that we all understand what's expected.
Very good. Well, excellent discussion, and thank you all for being here. I uh, would like to go back there and welcome my guests again, of course, Nathan Triplett, Mayor of East Lansing. Uh, congratulations, by the way. You were the interim well, last time you were here. So, uh, Emily Devendorf, she's the Executive Director at Equality Michigan. Thank you very much. And, of course, Sam Singh, State Rep for our 69th District. Thank you all. I'd like to thank everybody for joining us, and we'll see you next time on Open Line. Good night.